Welcome to the Alam Santi Ecologic Project Design Module. So in this module, we're going to look at a few things together that relate to how to do effective ecological project design. So what are we going to learn about? We're going to learn about what are some of the common challenges that people face when they enter into the world of ecological design. We're going to learn about how important the links are between the planning and the design and the coordination um, because it's quite a complex process and that's really the essence of success is ensuring that your coordination is really good throughout those phases. We're going to look at what a step-by-step -step sort of logical strategic design process is and why that can really increase the efficiency of your project. We're going to talk a little bit about what kind of decisions that the clients, the, the owners of the projects, the clients of the projects are going to be faced with as the process unfolds and how they can prepare for that. And last but not least, we'll look at some tools and some resources that Alam Santi has available that can be used to um, help you through this really fascinating journey of an ecological project design. So what are the key challenges of eco ecological projects? Well, one of the main things, sort of what's shown in this image, is you're sort of getting a clash between you know, the conventional way that projects these days are designed and developed and these new ideas that are emerging, which are also old ideas that have been around for a, a long time, a lot of them, on how to make um, your buildings and your facilities and your spaces more ecologically sound. So a lot of times these clash into each other as the design process unfolds, which we'll learn more about as we go. So what are the key challenges? Well, first of all, planning and develop, designing and developing any project, eco or not, is really complicated. There's a lot of moving parts involved. Um, there's a lot of specialists involved. Um, it's a complex job. And then on top of that, you add on all of your eco innovation and, you know, crazy new ideas, oh, I want to do it like this, and I want to make this better, um, then it gets extra in interesting and extra complicated. The methodologies, the strategies for eco-developments aren't really taught in our schools, so, you know, our architects are... Uh, mechanical engineers they don't really have the background and the training in how to do these th how to do these strategies and the strategies aren't mainstream so there isn't really a standard methodology for this type of design work out there at this point but we can change that and then last but not least the contractors don't have a lot of experience building these systems so that means when you're looking at, you know, planning your project, costing your project, um, it's hard to get straight answers from people about, you know, it's going to take this long or it's going to cost that much. Um, so you're dealing with a, quite a lot of unknowns when you enter onto this journey. The other thing about eco-projects that's kind of interesting is the clients. So making the decision to do a project ecologically is usually a decision that's made by somebody who's quite visionary and you know they're willing to take some risks because they care about the environment and um, doing it right and you know, generally speaking these people are quite optimistic visionary people and the thing about visionaries is that science shows that visionaries tend to underestimate the time and cost needed to do things. And um, they tend to have pretty big bandwidths because they're used to thinking about, you know, big ideas and new things. But there's a pretty major bandwidth requirement to undertake an eco-project development. So, you know, what's the result of these two things? On the one hand, we've got 
you know, innovation and complexity. On the other hand, we have visionary mindsets that are going, you know, let's do this wonderful new thing. What Alam Santi has seen in the projects that we do is, um, what easily arises with that is um, you have some key challenges. So the first is the time, the time that you need to pull the project off. There's a lot of extra time required for research, there's extra time required for design integration from different specialists. And um, yeah, most often you find that your project is dealing with a shifting schedule. Um, takes longer than you expected. There's a bandwidth challenge. So, you know, there's a lot of decision making that needs to be made. There's a lot of issues that need to be resolved that we don't really think about when we first start. And um, this can get pretty overwhelming for both the clients and the designers on the project. Money. Um, as, as we mentioned earlier, a lot of these strategies are quite new and haven't been implemented by many people. So then, you know, quoting, what is this going to cost me to do this eco strategy um, is sometimes tricky to determine the real costs involved. A lot of the components are quite unique as well. So, you know, integrating those components into your budget is quite important. So, you know, as your time, your bandwidth, the cost of your project um, gets stretched thin, um, yeah, it, it makes tension within the team. It makes tension for the clients. Um, and that's something that is important to manage throughout the process. Unfortunately, because of all of these factors, a lot of people um, who find themselves, you know, having embarked on this, idea visionary plan to do something eco and do it right and do it better they end up sort of giving up somewhere along the way because it's just too much work and it's there's too many unknowns and you know the budget blows out or whatever it is whatever those issues are so this uh, module is about looking at antidotes to those things and looking at how can how, how can we resolve some of these challenges um, by thinking ahead and mitigating some of the things that we know are challenges. It's important because, you know, eco-development is a critical path these days. We have to learn how to develop better. We're losing water, we're losing forests, we're losing um, all sorts of things as development and over-development and unplanned development and not eco-development grows and grows. So. We have some ideas on how we can turn the tides on that. The first thing is about cooperation and coordination. So it's, it's extremely important that the team that gathers around your project is in a, in a mood and um, feeling good about the idea that they're going to work together um, towards one goal and the goal is we want to do this project ecologically and that's important to us and we're going to figure out together through the ups and downs of the process how that can be possible as a team. So let's look at what this actually looks like in terms of the process, what's involved in this, how complex is it actually. So project starts with a seed and there's a brief from a visionary client to an architectural firm or an architect that, you know, this is my project and this is what I want to do. And then following that comes a series of other core designers that work together with that architectural firm, sometimes under the auspice of the architectural firm to build that core design out. So those include the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing designers, the interior designers and the landscape designers. These are the broad areas of design that are involved in a project. And then throughout that process, you've also got legal considerations. So what is what is permissible, what is um, licensed, what is appropriate to do from a legal standpoint. So these are your core designers and your core teams. There are certain stages that um, all of these core teams go through to get you to the point where you can actually start building um, your project. So the stages start with what's called conceptual design. So conceptual design is, you know, ideas and 
it's usually demonstrated in what's called mood, mood boards. So these are, you know, images and sketches and ideas of how this thing might look once it's done. That gives you a taste of what your project's going to look like. The mood boards will eventually um, spread out to delivering a whole range of different aspects of the design, um, which we'll go into more detail in a bit later. And um, one of the interesting things about this, you can see on the color wheel, there's certain areas where there's overlapping between, for example, architectural and mechanical electrical plumbing, like pool designs or um, landscapes and interiors where lighting is required for both. The next stage of design following that is what's called schematic design. So schematic design is where the concepts start to get a little bit more technical. So we start to look at, okay, we have this pretty picture of what a bathroom is going to look like, or a garden. How do we actually build that thing? What's, what's the what's the floor plan look like, what does the elevation of the building look like, that sort of thing. So it's the first step of the technical design. And then following that is what's called design development. This is the biggest stage of the design process where, you know, sometimes hundreds of drawings are produced by these different um, core teams. And um, it's important, as you can imagine, that these these different teams that are working on the designs are also coordinating really well with each other because if there's a change in the architecture that's going to affect the mechanical and the plumbing and the interior design and so on and so on. The, the changes, the matrix is too complicated to have a single answer but um, the essence of the point is that at the, especially the design development stage, the coordination between the different design teams is very, very important. Then following design development, you have what's called the construction document. So out of those designed technical drawings comes the drawings that you need to do things like, you know, cost the uh, project and um, determine what type of time frame you're looking at, determine how many different separate contractors and subcontractors you're going to be dealing with. Um, so these are the documents that are used for that process. And then throughout this process of design, you also have a legal process that unfolds. So you, know, you start with ensuring that all of your land documents are in order, that your zoning is appropriate, um, you look at your permits um, to develop the project, and then the building permits, um, and finally, if, it, if it's any kind of enterprise, um, you're also going to be looking at getting operating licenses for your enterprise to be able to be functional. So this legal process can unfold um, sort of simultaneously to the design process as different drawings that are needed to make your legal applications become available to you. There's more specialists, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, in fact, there's a lot of them. And those specialists come into play at different stages of the design development. <clears throat> so the first is what's called quantity surveyors. Quantity surveyors can either be members of your own team or you can hire a special team to do it. And they can br be brought in as often as you like. They're basically the uh, budget check people. So they check as your project unfolds, as your design unfolds, what is it going to cost you to actually do this? And um, you may make some choices along the way based on quantity surveying that you need to do some what's called value engineering. So pull back on certain ideas or stage certain parts of your project because you can't afford to do the whole thing all at once. But um, ideally, cooperation between the quantity surveyor and your design team and yourself as a client is going to allow you to come up with cost saving or you know cost efficient strategies that will allow you to manifest the project as a whole. The other specialists that will come into play include things like topographical surveyors, um, biopool system designers, structural engineers, rainwater harvesting specialists, ecological wastewater treatment specialists, renewable energy specialists, 
lighting designers, and finally, um, Am Santi strongly recommends that you have a local cultural advisor on your project to ensure that what you're doing is um, in harmony with the community that's around you, in harmony with local beliefs. Um, yeah, and it's, that's a really, of course, very fascinating part of the process of design as well. So these additional specialists will depend on your project, depend on your goals, um, but generally speaking, on a you know mid mid to large scale development, we would see all of these specialists, and sometimes even more than that, involved in a project. It is important to note, however, that they don't all need to be brought in right at the beginning. There's certain logical steps where those specialists become involved, and um, if you want to keep your design flow systematic and not get overwhelmed with too many questions too early in the game, you can follow what's shown in this wheel in terms of planning the timing for when to bring in those various specialists to keep the process flowing. Last but certainly not least is what we call client specifications. Now this is a big part of the job for the clients. It's, it's all of the many, many choices, selections, decisions that the client needs to make um, in terms of what this project is going to be. And um, we'll just run, th run through them quickly one by one. So there's what the type of outfitting that you're going to use that will involve um, MEP. There's landscapes that use MEP specifying for your utility supply, what kind of construction materials you want to use, what kind of finishing materials, so like after it's built you want to use, and then the additional outfitting for um, the interiors and exteriors that doesn't require MEP. The reason the, the outfitting and um, landscapes um, specifications is split into two different categories is the, the things that include MEP of course need to be specified early on before the MEP designer plans where are the plugs where are the pipes all this sort of thing um, and then there's other things that you can um, delay the decision making on until a bit later um, so that you don't have to deal with too many questions all at the same time but the um, yeah the outfitting and landscaping without MEP, you can launch into that pretty much at any point. So wouldn't it be fun to tick all of those boxes off? We're going to show you how. That's what this presentation is about. So we just looked at a very complex matrix, um, which is um, how the pieces of the puzzle sort of fit together. And um, now we're going to look at a logical flow. What are the step-by-step -step processes for the coordination and implementation of this design process? And sort of look a, a little bit also at the who does what and when kind of questions. So this is uh, in more of a flow chart format. And um, um, Santi has a, an infographic that we share with our clients that sort of helps them to keep track of the roadmap of their design process that looks like this. These are the key elements of that chart. So the first is um, the white icons that you see, those are showing various design or decision-making steps that happen throughout the process that the client will um, be able to keep track of together with their design team and also they'll need to sign off on some of these stages of work. So it's good for them to be aware of that before it starts all happening and also to know well, what are the things that you really do need to sign off on. When there's arrows in between those icons that means there's a logical flow between you know one step of design needs to be done before the next one can start. Um, in the case where there isn't arrows between them um, the different design work can start independently and, and that's an important consideration when you're talking about time because if we did every single one of these steps separately, I mean some of them can take more than a month so you'd be looking at many years to finish your design work so that's not really viable. <clears throat> when the green color in the under behind the icons is darker that means <clears throat> there's overlapping design that's involved in that 
step of design work. So the darker the color, the more overlaps you're dealing with, um, which is important to note because that's when you need to get more than one designer around a table, sitting together, working together, coordinating on their work. And where these arrows come in, it shows where certain steps of design feed into other steps of design. So you can't begin uh, something that's at the end of an arrow before what's at the beginning is ready to be factored into that design work. The orange sort of peach colored strips is about this, the really um, critical path uh, checks that the client needs to make when they receive a, a stage of design work from their designers. What are the things that you really need to watch out for? Um, so there's little pointers and tips on that. And then last but not least is back again to these points where the client needs to specify certain things so that the design work can continue to flow. So you can see there's a lot of relationships between um, the arrows and the client decision making. So let's go a little bit closer into um, each of the steps in this process because um, it's a bit hard to see. It's, it's a lot of bits and bobs. So the first step, so back, we, we talked earlier about stages of design. So here we are at the concept stage. So what happens at the concept stage? Um, we have a briefing by the client to you know clarify and explain what it is that they are looking for. And Alam ha Santi has quite a few tools that can help with that process that are available on our website. Um, and then your designers will come back to you with mood boards, sketches, and conceptual plans, sort of ideas that you can look at and go, oh yeah, that's what I'm interested in, that's what I want, that's what my goal is. It's a very collaborative um, step that, between the designers and the clients. Then uh, you'll bring in a topographical surveyor who will tell you, you know, what's the shape of your land, what's, what's, what's nature's story in this design work and um, then if you choose to be working in 3D modeling you can start converting your mood board your conceptual plans into more of a 3D model type of thing which will really as a, cl as a client will give you a better sense of what it is that um, you're embarking on and then comes uh, following that can come the first step of estimating what the cost would be to implement your project which is very important um, to do to get a sense of you know is is this beautiful concept that you and your architect are excited about is this something you can actually afford because if you can't afford it you need to go back to the drawing board and think about well what other kind of concept can you come up with that is more in alignment with your um, budget goals and once you get through this process then you can um, award your, your design contracts to those people that you feel that you can work with to manifest the project that you're looking for in a budget that is reasonable um, in terms of your budget goals. So once this is the fun part of the work, by the way, um, and people get really excited and really enjoy this process most of the time. And uh, but following this, this is just one line on this that long flow chart we were looking at before. So now, have a look at how the work begins based on the decisions made at this step. So the next step, um, the beginning of schematic design. For this step, um, pretty much the clients can sit back and wait and see what their designers come back to them with. Um, of course, you know, they do need to sign off on that work and they need to be aware that signing off on that work is going to have a ripple effect into a, the much more detailed ongoing design work that comes from there on in. And then uh, you can see how the decisions that you make at this layer then lead into a whole bunch of decisions at the following layer. Um, so yeah, it is important to make sure that you're happy with what you're signing off on um, because then it's going to break out into several new designs and involve new specialists that are going to come in such as like civil engineers or uh, rainwater specialists, renewable energy specialists. Um, and at, at this next stage, which is the beginnings of design development, 
the client needs to make quite a lot of choices. This is one of the more heavy um, layers of work for the client. Um, they particularly need to make choices about anything that's going to affect their NEP design. Um, and they also need to make some, you know, sign off on suggestions on what the construction materials should be for their project because that can affect the civil engineering which is coming next. So then we go into the next stage of design development. Um, you can see here how uh, the, early, the first strip of decision making really feeds into the utility supply, um, shown in the sort of bottom left area. And you can also see how civil engineering has quite a few different considerations that need to be factored. So this is the continuation of design development. Um, as mentioned earlier, it's the more complex process uh, or stage of the design work. So uh, following this stage of design development, um, the work is then going to shift over to construction documentation. And it's also going to shift over to interior design. Um, so that's, you know, you can't really start doing too much interior design until the design development of your buildings is very clear and pretty much in place. Um, otherwise, you come up with all these plans that don't actually fit into your building. So there's, there's an importance in terms of staging that um, in the correct flow. And then um, this is another example of where um, there's a logical flow on how you do things. So say if you want to start doing your lighting design, well, you're, the lighting that is going to be appropriate for your site, especially if you're doing you know, an ecological development where you want to look at energy efficiency and use of low watt LED bulbs and so on, you want to really you know, be very strategic in terms of how you do that design work. So that's going to depend on, you know, Areas where you have a study desk or areas where you're cooking meals, you want to have what's called task lighting um, directly focused on those areas so those areas are well lit. And then you don't need to have too much lighting throughout the space, um, which is going to you know, uh, add additional energy bills because you weren't sure about where different components of your design are placed. Um, okay, just everybody take a little deep breath here because we are getting close to the end of this, I promise. <laughs> okay, construction documentation. So at this point, um, each of your core design teams, those, those pieces of the pie chart we were looking at earlier, should wrap up their design work. So that means your MEP team, the architectural and engineering team, the interiors team, and the landscapes team is going to need to get to the point where their design work is ready to be properly costed. And you can um, take that to whoever the contractors are going to be. So um, this also is a very important stage of sign-off on behalf of the client because this is it. These are the official documents that are going to go into implementation. And um, depending on how you as a client decide to um, work with your outfitting plans, this is also the stage where you might want to you know, go deeper into finalizing all of the furniture and the different elements that you want to add into your project. And then last but not least, um, the same groupings of drawings. Um, so MEP, architecture, interiors, and landscape. Um, those drawings need sort of a final check to make sure that since, you know, different groups have been doing the design work, are all of those designs properly uh, overlaid on top of each other. So, you know, are the buildings in the same place? Do you have a design drawing version control problem, which is very common for those types of issues to come up? Um, you also want to make sure that you've got all of your building permits and um, any utility hookups um, clearly established at this point. 
And then once that's all together, you can uh, do what's called an owner's estimate, which is um, an initial calculation of what this project will actually cost to be built. This is quite a detailed um, estimate on you know all the bits and pieces that you specified earlier, um, the pumps, the on and on and on, so many different things that are included in your project are they included on your budget plan. The owner's estimate is a document that can, that can then be taken to um, various contractors if you plan to do a tendering process. Um, and then you get a sort of apples to apples comparison on your tender um, because everyone's bidding for the same project with the same spec, with the same details. Um, and you can make your tendering process a lot smoother in that way. And then once you get through ten tendering, which is, you know, giving the opportunity for various contractors to provide you with a quote on what they would charge you to do the actual implementation for your project. Then you select the contractors that you feel best about. Um, can be based on a lot of different criteria, you know, their portfolio, their track record, um, uh, do they have the best prices, do they have the best quality or service. There's a lot of different factors that go into choosing your final contractor. And, um, and then um, it's time to award them contracts to build the project. And again, Alam Santi has some really great uh, templates for this sort of thing, which are bilingual in both English and Indonesian. So it's, there's no chance of you know, misunderstanding or miscommunication about what those contract details are about. Guess what? You made it. That's it. That's the basic design process, um, except for a little bit more detail that we'll go into now to help to clarify what this sort of big uh, area of work called client specifications is about. So client specifications, um, just a little bit here about what the best practice is on sourcing and specifying different um, items for your project. Um, so one is about, well, who, who is going to source those items? Is it you? Is it the designers? Is it the contractors? Um, there can be a, quite a gray area around that, about who is going to source what. Um, as, as a rule of thumb, Alan Santi sort of recommends that if your contractor has the ability to supply the items that you're looking for, um, generally speaking, it's better to include those items on their contracts of delivery. Um, but there's there's certain situations um, where that just isn't possible. The, it's better for the client to do what's called SBO, which is supplied by owner, where the client is going to source certain items and then hand them over to the contractor to have them installed. Um, it's very important throughout the process. You're going to make a lot of decisions and a lot of choices about, you know, I want these colors or these finishes or these materials or these pieces of equipment to keep signed samples of um, what you've agreed to. Ideally, both you and your contractor have a set of signed samples, so there's no um, miscommunication or misunderstanding about what's been agreed upon. And it, those samples are also really useful because they give you an opportunity to like test things out on site and have a look at, well, how does this color actually look in my space? Um, or how does this item fit in this space? The other thing to be careful of, we, we've often seen um, issues with, is um, you might sort of find something really nice online or see an example at somebody else's place of a, an item that you think is really wonderful, but it may not be available anymore. So it's important to check that the items that you're considering to specify in your project actually are available at this time, either, you know, Ideally, from an eco perspective, um, something that's sourced locally, um, it doesn't have too much of a carbon footprint. Um, this is some of the considerations in sourcing. And then the other thing to check if um, you're doing any items uh, that you're sourcing yourself as a client is what's called the indent time, which is the amount of time from the day you uh, purchase it to the day it's actually going to arrive on site because certain items, especially when you get into these 
kind of um, innovative eco technology elements, they can take quite a long time to be delivered, and that can affect your implementation plan. So in that regard, it's it's generally good practice to quite soon in the game prepare a storage area, so a lockable storage unit where you can you can just start purchasing things and putting them in your storage so that they're ready and available when the time comes for them to be needed on the project site. For any items that use any type of MEP, of course, you're going to want to really look for your optimum ecological choices. So, you know, are they energy efficient? Are they water efficient? Um, is it a sustainable building material? Um, these are all important considerations and um, something that should be factored. And then finally, just to keep in mind that there might be things that you thought of earlier in the process that once the design development unfolds, you realize that that's no longer the best choice or it's no longer the best option and you may need to do a little bit of updating on your sourcing plans as you go through the process. So just in brief, what are the different elements um, that the client is going to be specifying? Um, and this can really vary. Um, from client to client in terms of how deeply they want to get involved. Um, things include, you know, outfitting with MEP requirements. So th this is um, any type of um, pieces that are going to be added to your project that's going to need either a plug or a pipe um, or a piece of mechanical equipment to run. So when do you make these decisions? You have to make these decisions before the major MEP design work is and interior work is underway because there's a really big ripple effect between these items and those areas of design. So it includes things like um, your sanitary fittings, your climate control, appliances, lighting, um, data requirements, and any other outfitting that's going to require MEP. And then the next grouping is um, landscape elements that have MEP requirements. So, you know, things like water features or so on. So this needs to happen, again, before major MEP is underway. And um, ideally, we'd also f uh, fit into the landscape design. So things like your pool, if you're going to have any um, pools, is it going to be a biological pool or another system? Uh, any water features? Are you going to be using electrical, electric vehicles that require power? Um, your outdoor lighting? Um, and any equipment or fittings in the outdoors that are going to require any type of electrical or plumbing components? Next is about your utility lines. So um, this is something where, generally speaking, the client is going to sign off on what's recommended by the MEP designer, especially if that MEP designer has experience with ecological MEP design. Um, if they don't, you may need to get a little bit more deeply involved in that. So um, there's things that relate to your power supply, are you going to be using renewable energy, and in that case there's a lot of decisions to make. Um, are you going to be using uh, rainwater harvesting for your water systems? What, kind of, what are you going to use for hot water heating? What do you want to do with your wastewater? That's a very interesting topic with a lot of eco strategies. Um, what type of internet do you need, and also any type of gas considerations for your project. The next grouping is um, construction materials. So, you know, um, with eco projects, you want to have a little look at how are you building your building. So this tends to happen um, once your floor plans and uh, building elevation drawings are done. But it, ideally, it happens before you start um, going too deep with civil engineering because the weight of materials and the type of materials used can definitely affect the type of civil engineering that's appropriate for your project. So you need to look at things like um, your roofs, um, your 
awnings, decks, walls, um, what kind of ventilation or passive cooling or passive lighting are you going to be using, um, any custom elements, so, you know, carved features or panels, um, railings, gates, um, that's going to, once those are specified, you need to sort of set in motion the design work that's required to fulfill those things or the sourcing. Um, what kind of doors and windows you want to use, how you like them to swing, should they lock or not. Um, these types of things can be quite personal and uh, clients may want, have different opinions on how they want to do that. And finally, your rainwater fittings. So there's a lot of options with your rainwater fittings, so you want to look into what you feel is best for your project. Then the next category is called finishing materials. So finishing materials is sort of like the, the, uh, the clothes that are worn by the building. So the building is built, but then um, it's finished. Um, this tends to happen once architecture and interior design is well underway. It includes things like, you know, what type of ceilings do you want? Um, what type of uh, texture or color do you want to use on your walls? Um, do you have any uh, preferences about the wood that's used and the finishing of that wood? Um, different uh, floor and stair toppings and uh, the kind of hardware you want to use and what does it look like. It's very, you know, it's an amazingly amount, a large amount of uh, different hardware op options to choose from. Um, there's a series of different things to consider for your windows and vents. And um, lastly, decorative elements and lighting. So, yeah, quite a few things to consider at this stage of the game. But it's it's really the... It's the fun part. It's the art of the project in a way. So for those who enjoy, you know, color and shape and form and art, this is this is a really fun stage of work. And then um, you've got the outfitting that doesn't have MEP requirements. So you can really start this at any point, um, but it's important to consider that you don't purchase things or um, plan to integrate things that aren't going to actually fit in your space. Um, so it's, it's things like your furniture, your storage, uh, any window dressing, soft furnishings, what kind of light bulbs you're going to use, um, artwork, signage, um, safety equipment is a really important part of this stage. Um, any type of outfitting of your bathrooms and kitchens and kitchenettes in your project, so it's, this is kind of the, the stuff that you're going to have in your spaces. And then last but not least is um, a similar category, but where it relates to the exterior spaces. So the time frame is similar and the considerations are similar. It's things like, you know, how do you want your um, outdoor patios and retaining to be finished, and um, do you have any kind of artwork, planters that you want to include, um, outdoor furniture, that sort of thing. Yeah, we get this a lot. So <laughs> <clears throat> after people get a little bit more aware of what's involved in doing a project, um, it feels really overwhelming. In fact, it is overwhelming a lot of, to a lot of people. Um, especially if they're doing it for the first time. So Elm Santi has spent a lot of time really thinking this through and thinking through um, some ways to make this process easier, um, less stressful, more efficient, and more effective. And we want to talk about that with you just for a little bit. So there's an online tool that we like to use um, for project coordination. It's called Asana. Um, and it's free for up to 15 people to use. So if you have a team that has 15 people or less, it's um, free. And after that, there's monthly fees you can pay. Um, 
One of the cool things about Asana is you can access it on any device, so on your computer, your handphone, your tablet. So it's it's quite practical in this sort of modern digital age. And basically it manages the tasks that you have um, for your project. And it's interesting that it can provide that task information to you in several different formats. So some people like to just have, you know, lists of to-do. Other people are more interested in looking at a bigger picture, sort of a Gantt work plan type format. And other people just like to know, like, what's coming next in my calendar? So the same data that you plug into Asana can be presented in these different ways, which is quite useful for um, broad spectrum teams like you're generally dealing with on a project like this. So let's have just a, a really quick look at how what Asana does and how it works. With Asana, your team can take on big projects and get them done. It all starts with a project that you can break down into smaller tasks. Assign tasks and set due dates so everyone's clear on what to do and when to do it. As you start working, loop in other teammates and have conversations that move tasks forward. You'll get updates on the things you're following and can see progress and deadlines anytime. With your team working together in Asana, you can easily move from big idea to great results. Okay, so that's a, a little intro to Asana. There's heaps more information online you can look at um, to decide whether that's the right tool for you. So Alam Santi um, has a series of specification and sourcing sheets um, that we can make available to people. We use um, Google Drive, so we put this sort of thing in the cloud, which makes it more accessible to different um, team members. So again, this coordination issue, this um, cooperation. And we also have uh, plenty of you know, tried and tested eco-friendly products that we've used on various projects um, that can be shared. Uh, in terms of knowing, well, what should I get? What's it going to cost? And where does it come from? And um, last but not least, mentioned earlier, we have um, bilingual project contracts, which um, are based on you know years of working with various designers and builders and looking at you know what are the general questions or issues that come up um, within a con contractual agreement that relates to eco developments so you know feel free to visit the shop that's on the Alam Santi website and have a look at the different resources that are available there or contact us if you want more information so thanks very much that's it for today um, it's a very complex module and we hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about ecological project design and we look forward to hearing from you